Let's pretend that this trust that I'm holding on is my love and honor to God, who is always good, always kind. He is perfect. And that trust over there is how I feel about my neighbor. Or maybe my enemy, who is definitely not perfect, but annoying and disappointing, and maybe even downright mean. And yet God tells me I need to love and honor my less than perfect neighbors, and even my enemies. How do I bridge the gap from here to there? That's the topic of our lesson today on the Lord's Prayer and the Fifth Commandment. And now, here's my dad, Brett Smith, and my friend, Sabrina Ross. The Lord's Prayer is the daily prayer of alignment, which helps us align our heart to the heart of the Father. This model prayer given to us by Jesus is recorded in two of the Gospels, Matthew and Luke. When this happens, I tend to think of it in terms of being doubly important to my understanding of the kingdom of God. The accounts are slightly different, which is to be expected from an event reported by two separate individuals. Whenever two people witness the same event, they each see things from a slightly different perspective. And the more accounts we can read, the more clear our understanding. The recording of this prayer in Matthew is a little more thorough than the one in Luke. So we will use it as we explore the rich meaning to be gleaned from it. Let's read it with Jesus speaking. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The Ten Commandments reveal the heart of the Father in heaven to us. It is interesting to note the order in which he gives us these commandments. The first four commandments deal with our attitude toward God. No other gods but Yahweh. No idols made with our own hands. Always use his name with reverence. And devote time each week to rest and to worship him. The last five commandments deal with our attitude toward our neighbor. For Jesus explained to us that the outward actions of breaking these commandments are the result of the attitude of our hearts. Do not murder or hate your neighbor in your heart. Do not commit adultery or dwell on impure sexual thoughts. Do not steal. Do not tell lies or use your tongue or your pen or your keyboard to slander your neighbor. And do not covet your neighbor's things or be jealous when he is blessed. But right in the middle of these commandments is the one that bridges the gap between heaven and earth. Commandment number five demonstrates that we honor our heavenly father by honoring our earthly father in the relationship that God designed from the beginning to help us understand the kind of relationship that he wants to have with each of his children. The New Testament reiterates and expounds on this Old Testament command in several places. And the Greek word which is translated honor is temao. A part of the definition of this word is to estimate or fix the value or price of something. Many people have no problem honoring or assigning a high value to God who is a perfect father, but they find it hard to honor or assign a high value to their earthly father, who is not perfect. This leads to an attitude and a lifestyle of dishonor. For it is in adjusting our heart to honor an imperfect father and mother that we learn to extend honor 
to the other imperfect relationships around us. 1 John chapter 4 says, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. If you change the word brother to father, you can make a statement that is just as true. If anyone says, I honor and assign great value to my heavenly father, whom he has not seen, and yet gives no honor or value to his earthly father and mother, whom he has seen, he is a liar. The devil will tell you, but honor has to be earned. <laughs> Wrong. Respect may be earned, but honor is given. It is a gift. Give everyone what you owe him. If honor, then honor. Aha, you say, but I don't owe it unless someone earns it. <laughs> Not true again. Honor one another above yourselves. So who is one another? Is that only the people who I think have earned honor? Or is it all the people God has placed in my environment? So hold on, Brett. Are you telling me that the church leader who should have been kind to me and helped me when I was confused, but instead he was disrespectful and made it clear he had no time for me, I need to honor him? Absolutely. How about a grown child who has zero gratitude for what his parents have sacrificed for him? Or a spouse who is continually acting in a hurtful manner? Or a brother-in-law who is an annoying know-it-all? Or the co-worker who stole my idea and took my promotion? Yes, God has assigned value to each of these. He honors them, and he wants us to view them the same way he does and give them the gift of honor as well. Now, uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that you simply allow people to do you harm without confronting them over their hurtful behavior. Christians who follow the example of Jesus are very confrontational, but the confrontation is respectful and it is for the purpose of maintaining connection and creating understanding, not for the devil's purpose of condemnation, ridicule, or cutting off relationship. But what about my mom or dad who have been so mean to me? Do I need to honor them too? Yes, especially them. They are the ones who help you bridge that difficult gap between honoring a flawless God and honoring very flawed people. Well, Brett, let me just tell you about my experiences learning how to honor my parents, even when I felt like they had done things that were less than honorable. I had a normal childhood. My daddy worked to provide for his family and my mother stayed home to take care of the house and her little girl. I loved my daddy. There were many nights when we shared long conversations into the night and I would fall asleep talking to him and then wake up in the morning and realize he had carried me to my bed. I remember many things and many times when he took me to work with him and have wonderful memories of card games and Lego blocks. But at the age of 18, I was surprised to discover that I had been adopted. At that point, I felt as though I had been lied to my whole life. Regrettably, I never confronted my daddy with this feeling. Mm. So at this point, it would be normal for you to have a desire to connect with your birth father. Did your daddy understand this and encourage you regarding this? No. I'm sorry to say he did not handle it well at all. In fact, it changed the dynamics of our whole relationship. Looking back, I think he was afraid that he might lose everything he had invested in our relationship. But at the time, I simply could not understand why he would be angry with me for wanting to connect with my birth father. This led to a lot of arguing over decisions I made and uncovered other things about my daddy's behavior that were upsetting. 
And at the time, I understand you were not a believer and did not have a framework for how to deal with these changing dynamics? Exactly. I did not understand the kingdom concepts of forgiveness, mercy, and honor. And I did not understand what Jesus said about the importance of confrontation with love. Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. Mm, yes. I did not know that I had a God-given requirement to go to my daddy and sit down with him and resolve our differences. These unresolved differences led to our relationship becoming very shallow because we never really talked about the important issues that were on our minds. But then, after you were born again into the kingdom of God, you came to realize that you had been restored into a relationship with another father in heaven. Yes. And over time I learned, and I'm still learning, about communication and confrontation in a safe environment of honor and commitment. But your earthly father died before you had an opportunity to apply these kingdom principles to your relationship with him? Yes. Unfortunately, I never addressed the feelings I was experiencing or sought to understand the feelings my daddy was experiencing. Mm. Unresolved anger, bitterness, and ingratitude will always lead to misalignment with God and his destiny for our lives. I believe you struggled with these for a long time, didn't you? Yes. Unintentionally, I transferred that anger, bitterness, and ingratitude from my earthly daddy to my heavenly daddy. So when opportunities for growth or leadership would come to me, I still had these unresolved father issues in my heart, and I would back away. But you eventually began to appreciate what your father had done for you? Yes, it took a while for the Lord to help me understand how much my daddy had sacrificed for me, because for so long all I could see was his faults. The devil had blinded me and kept bringing to my remembrance all of his sins and shortcomings. But as the Holy Spirit began to work with me, he brought to my remembrance all the sacrifices my daddy had made for me. For example, when I was 16 years old and it was nearly Christmas, I was talking on the phone with a friend and she asked me, so what are you getting for Christmas? I knew that daddy was having a hard time financially, so I told her I was not expecting anything. I was not being pitiful or anything, just realistic. I did not know that my daddy could hear me. He left the house shortly thereafter and came home with a whole bag full of presents. He had taken the money set aside to pay the bills and used it to buy the gifts and then worked long extra hours at work to make up the difference. I asked him, Daddy, why would you do this? What did you do this for? I know that times are hard. And he said, because you're my daughter and I want you to have the things that will make you happy. I also remember continually meeting people and hearing them say, oh, so you're Sabrina. I've heard so much about you. And they would talk about a good grade I had received or an award I had received or some other thing that daddy had bragged about to them. I also had this false view of what it meant to be adopted as though somehow that made me a second class daughter. But one day, the truth about adoption broke through to me. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. The Lord showed me that while the responsibility of raising a birth child just happens to a birth father, my adoptive father actually chose me. Mm. Mm. He did not have to take on this responsibility but he did it in accordance with his pleasure and his will. He chose to care for me, to love me, to provide for me. He made many sacrifices over the years because I was his chosen daughter. After I discovered I was adopted, I became consumed with trying to find out who my birth father was and why he had rejected me. I was deceived by the devil into this feeling of rejection from a birth father I had never even met and knew nothing about. But the feeling was a lie, because in reality, I had a daddy who loved me and had always been there for me. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I now see clearly 
how the fact that daddy worked so hard for so many years and took that treasure he earned and spent it to care for me is undeniable proof that he loved me. So when you began to take a more spiritually mature view of your daddy and develop a heart of gratitude towards him, how did that affect your own spiritual growth? I never sat down with daddy and asked him why he didn't say the things that hurt me. Instead, I listened to the lies of the devil that told me that I was a disappointment to my daddy. When I came of age and daddy and I would disagree over something, he would display frustration and anger, which I interpreted as rejection. I never sat down with him and looked him in the eye and said, Hey, daddy, why are you speaking to me this way? Instead, I harbored resentment towards him. After my daddy passed away, I got saved. As I began to grow in my relationship with God, I experienced hindrances. I would grow closer to him, go deeper in his word, receive visions and instructions from him, but eventually I would reach a point where I was afraid that I was going to fail him. I had this false belief that I had failed my daddy that he was disappointed in me and had rejected me. So I was afraid that I would disappoint my heavenly daddy and that he would reject me too. It took several years of continuing to press into God, but eventually he showed me that the anger and frustration I saw in my daddy did not mean he had rejected me, but that he was simply hurt and confused. In fact, I believe daddy felt as though I was rejecting him. And I can see plainly now that I did and said things that were not helpful. For example, I began calling my birth father my real dad, and that was very hurtful to my daddy. Oh, I could see that. Uh, you know, I'd see him saying, hey, I was the one who changed your diapers, and I was the one who took you to the doctor and fed you and... Mm -hmm. You know, I taught you how to ride a bicycle. I did, you know, helped you with your homework. All those years, I was the one that was there. And so if anybody's your real daddy, it's me. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So now when I talk to young mothers and fathers, I want to tell them, don't wait another day to sit down with your parents, reconcile whatever offenses you may have, and position yourself to give them honor. You're going to need the blessing that comes with honoring them. And before you know it, it may be too late mm. like it was for me. Mm. That's good. So this is my determination. God is perfect. I will give him honor. My father and mother are not perfect. I'll give them honor anyway. The people around me are definitely not perfect. But I will give them honor too because my heavenly father honors them so much. He assigns them so much value that he sent his only begotten son to redeem their imperfections at the cross. My father does not look at them as an accuser who sees their faults. Let's look at what Jesus said in John chapter 3. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The father did not send his son into the world to condemn the people whom I have trouble honoring, but rather to save these people through him. God does not look at us in terms of our past, but rather in terms of our potential. This is a key to your success, so let's say it again. God does not look at us in terms of our past, but rather in terms of our potential. When we align our heart with His, then we can see others the same way He does. The culture of the kingdom of God is a culture of honor. You will never foster an environment of supernatural encounters with God while at the same time participating in a culture of dishonor. This book, Culture of Honor by Danny Silk, is required reading for prophetic training students. In it, he demonstrates the devil's purpose in tempting you to engage in sarcasm, 
mocking, ridicule, and malicious accusations about others. It's all about shame. On page 40, we read, Shame tries to keep people trapped in their mistakes by convincing them that there is nothing they can do, that they are powerless. Shame and condemnation is the enemy of repentance. The devil brought shame on Adam and Eve after they sinned, which caused them to hide from God rather than do the one thing they needed to do, which was to run to God in repentance. A crowd brought a woman to Jesus and publicly shamed and condemned her. But the attitude Jesus displayed toward this woman was this, I do not condemn you. I do not see you as an adulterous woman. On the contrary, I see you fulfilling the divine destiny my Father has envisioned for you. So repent, go, and sin no more. We have every reason to believe that the kindness of Jesus towards her changed her whole life. Many Bible scholars believe that this woman was the same woman who later washed Jesus' feet with her tears, dried them with her hair, and anointed them with expensive perfume. So as you pray the Lord's Prayer, ask the Holy Spirit to help you embrace God's culture of honor. Father, I hallow your name and give you honor. I also give my earthly father and mother honor as a gift to you. And I also give my neighbor honor as a gift to you. Bye.